Spontaneous generation and abiogenesis are both explanations for the origin of life, but there's an important difference between them that a lot of people aren't aware of, so that's what I want to highlight today. Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 BCE, had a tremendous impact on modern scientific thinking. At the time, it was already understood that plants grew from seeds. However, if you've ever maintained a garden, you know that weeds seem to spring up spontaneously where you haven't actually planted anything. So it was believed at the time that some plants were self-generated from the nutrients in the ground. Aristotle wrote a series of books called History of Animals. In book number five, he suggested that animals formed spontaneously, just like plants seem to do. He wrote, so with animals, some spring from parent animals, according to their kind, whilst others grow spontaneously, from putrefying earth or vegetable matter, as is the case with a number of insects. At the time, this seemed like a plausible explanation, because if you dig in the earth, you'll probably find worms, and where there is rotting meat, it is often filled with maggots. Now let's fast forward to 1859. Louis Pasteur performed some experiments that tested spontaneous generation. He found that when food was both sterilized and kept isolated from the outside air, it did not seem to rot. This strongly suggested that spontaneous generation was probably wrong. Pasteur coined the principle of biogenesis. It states that living things can only come from other living things. Incidentally, that was the same year that Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, describing how natural selection guides the process of evolution. But if spontaneous generation didn't occur, then how did it all get started in the first place? Naturally, creationists like the principle of biogenesis. They tried to claim that it was some kind of a law, implying that nature was bound to follow this principle. However, nature doesn't really seem to regard the laws that we make. The term abiogenesis implies that life began without regard for the principle of biogenesis. But there is a significant difference between spontaneous generation and abiogenesis. Spontaneous generation was proposed before the theory of evolution. It suggests that something complex formed spontaneously. By contrast, abiogenesis was proposed after the theory of evolution. It suggests that something very simple began evolving. In other words, evolution was happening long before anything sophisticated enough to be called alive even existed. Here's a quote from the Wikipedia article on abiogenesis. It says, The prevailing scientific hypothesis is that the transition from non-living to living entities on Earth was not a single event, but a process of increasing complexity. One common but misguided argument I frequently hear involves statistical improbability. The person making this argument will identify some large biomolecule in a living bacterium. He will then calculate the odds that this large biomolecule might spontaneously form in a primordial soup of amino acids or nucleotides. He will then report the odds of that happening as being one out of some really humongous impossible number. That makes it pretty clear that there's no way that that could have just happened spontaneously. Now this is actually a valid argument against spontaneous generation, which science abandoned in 1859 in response to evidence. But with respect to abiogenesis, this argument does nothing more than destroy a straw man. To be clear, there are valid reasons to be skeptical about abiogenesis. For example, one of them is that scientists have not yet identified a complete evolutionary pathway from simple chemical reactions to living entities. But there's a reason for that. Nature is a whole lot better at finding evolutionary pathways than scientists are. That might sound counterintuitive because scientists are generally intelligent, right? I hope so. But there are a limited number of them, and not all scientists are working on this particular problem. By contrast, there are some pretty big populations in the process of evolving right now. If we just look at bacteria, for example, it's estimated that there are 5 times 10 to the 30th power of them living right now. They spawn a new generation every 20 to 60 minutes, and they've been going at it for considerably longer than scientists have. So if there is a viable evolutionary pathway, there's a pretty good chance that life will find it. With scientists, not so sure. So I'm sorry we don't yet know all the answers, but we're working on it. In the meantime, let's consider the simplest thing we can find that actually reproduces. How about fire? 
To be clear, I'm not suggesting life began as fire, but it's a pretty good example of a chemical reaction that people actually understand and can relate with, and it exhibits more properties of life than you might expect. For example, consider that fire consumes food. It voraciously seeks for more food. Fire produces waste. It generates heat. And when it runs out of food, it dies. It almost seems as if fire is alive, but it's not. Significantly, fire can grow. It doesn't have cellular envelopes, of course, so fire doesn't reproduce in discrete cellular units like all the things that we currently call living. But meeting our expectations is not actually a requirement for evolution to occur. And that's why abiogenesis is a possibility. You see, something non-living could have started evolving. Now, it might be reasonable to ask, can fire actually change? Well, there's nothing living about fireworks, but they change fire into many different colors and forms. And perhaps most significantly, fire is so simple that it occurs spontaneously. In fact, when lightning strikes, that happens quite frequently. We don't yet know what first started evolving on Earth, but it must have been something very simple, because complex things just don't occur spontaneously. These days, we might not observe a whole lot of spontaneous, simple chemical reactions, but they would have been much more common long ago, before all the volatile chemicals reacted to form relatively stable compounds like carbon dioxide and water. Let me mention one other very interesting observation. In 2022, scientists published a paper describing how RNA molecules with 100 to 300 nucleotides in length had been found to spontaneously form on basaltic glass. The reason this is significant is because basaltic glass was everywhere soon after the crust of the Earth cooled. Now, is this the actual pathway that led to the origin of life on the Earth? Let's not get too excited before scientists have a chance to scrutinize this, but it is a fascinating lead. So there are still plenty of reasons to be skeptical about abiogenesis. If you think abiogenesis is improbable, that's really not saying much. Most scientists would probably agree with you. But life does exist. There's no denying that, and there has to be some explanation. If you think you have a more plausible explanation, that would be a really big deal. In that case, lots of people would very much like to scrutinize your explanation. So far, no alternative explanation has withstood as much scrutiny as abiogenesis. That's why abiogenesis is currently the prevailing scientific explanation for the origin of life.